All righty, I think we're going to get started. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, I'm Chris Martin. I'm our policy director at Housing California. Um, this panel here today is going to talk about California's roadmap home, uh, and we'll talk about both the first year of the roadmap home, some of the accomplishments that we saw last year, um, and both uh, that and looking forward to the uh, current and, and future years and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, we'll try and take Q&A at the end, time permitting, um, so we'll, we'll try and hope, hopefully get to questions at the end, but, um, but before we get started, I'll ask our, our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Maybe starting with Cynthia. Hi all, I actually don't think I need the, the microphone. Uh, my name is Cynthia Castillo, I'm a policy advocate for Western Center on Law and Poverty. We are an anti-poverty organization, one of the longest and oldest legal support centers in the state. Um, and we advocate for low-income Californians through the, um, a lens of economic and racial justice, which is, um, I think, one piece uh, that is incredibly important for us and why we have endorsed the Roadmap Home uh, and uh, would love to pass it to Francisco. Hi, folks. Um, hoping, to, hoping to meet everybody. My name is Francisco Duenas. I'm the executive director of Housing Now. Housing Now is a statewide housing justice advocacy coalition. We're a big tent coalition, so we have um, in, folks in our coalition who are housing specialists, whether they be affordable housing providers or tenant, union, uh, tenant unions. But we also have a lot of community groups that are new to housing and are in hoping to engage in the issue as um, our housing crisis gets worse and is, affects more and more community members. Um, check us out, housingnowca.org. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm Matt Schwartz with the California Housing Partnership. And we're a think and do tank that provides technical assistance to producing and preserving affordable rental housing for the lowest income Californians around the state. Back to you, Chris. Well, I think I'm going to kick it right back to you to get us started about right. what the roadmap home Sorry is. about that. <laughs> All right. So where's David Zisser? I just need to locate him. Oh, there he is. All right. So this is uh, not the easiest of tasks in a moment when we have the godfather of the roadmap present, <laughs> um, formerly with Housing California, David Zisser. But I'm going to do my best mini David Zisser rendition. And... Um, I want to start off by just asking us all to think about the status quo that we're living in. And we're going to review some of the details of this. Each year we come up here, we have legislative ideas, we have budget ideas, uh, we talk to the administration, we talk to the legislature. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and a lot of good things have happened. But the reason a bunch of us spent two years working on the roadmap with some of you here and on this panel is because the status quo, even despite some victories, has gotten pretty frustrating. What we all realized is we need a vision. We need a vision with a long-term set of go clear goals that can unite us all so we can build and not just start over each year, but we can build on what we accomplish each year if we can have a unified vision and a platform. And for me, that's really what the roadmap is about is having this common platform with multiple pieces, and it's not necessarily perfect. What you're gonna see is, is a very much an in-process project. But it's giving us a way to all work together, even though you can see we're, our organizations come from different places. We don't do the exact same thing. Each of you contribute in different ways to the uh, housing, the homeless, providing affordable housing. So, this is a document that, if it's working well, gives us all a place to have a common language and a common set of goals and a map, a road map. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously, Housing California uh, anchored this. Big credit, to, again, to David Zisser and Lisa Hershey and uh, Chris and the rest of the staff for pushing forward this project. We joined them uh, pretty early in the process to provide uh, research and policy. Uh, technical work, and then the California Budget Center, Sarah Kimberlin, I hope you're listening in, um, played a huge role in doing a lot of the key research as well on many of the policy proposals. And then you can see the funders uh, who've been supporting Housing California's uh, anchor work in this project have been critical 
and uh, we hope that they will continue supporting Housing California and doing this work. Next slide, please. I want to acknowledge, to make this a roadmap that works for everyone, we needed to pull on a, a wide range of experiences and uh, perspectives from across the state. We could have had two or three times the number of people, but we couldn't manage it logistically. So this is a list of the folks who were actively uh, vetting the policies and coming up with the ideas, uh, some of which we'll talk about today, not all of them. You'll have to go online to see the full 250-page document with the 57 policy solutions that we're adding to each year. Next slide, please. And one piece that we helped with was to assemble, uh, because this needs to be evidence-based. Values are important, but so are, is evidence to make sure that we're getting grounded and we're not making stuff up, unlike what they do in DC sometimes. We're, we're trying not to do that. <laughs> so this is our uh, A list of researchers um, who do this in this area of homelessness and affordable housing, and they were critical in developing methodologies that we then uh, deploy to assess impacts for all these policies. Next slide, please. Four clear goals. These are the goals that we hope will unite us all in this work year after year to end homelessness. You can see when we wrote this, the number was still 150,000. Now, of course, we're over 160,000 and probably much higher if we actually had an accurate count. Uh, we calculated carefully we would need 1.2 million more homes to end the, co the high cost burdens that low-income Californians face. Um, and that's, so that translates into 120,000 new affordable homes a year. Anyone know how many we're producing right now? Close, yeah, right about 23, 24,000. And that is up over three times from where we were a few years back. So we're actually doing well in one hand, but not well enough in others. And we have a long way to go. Number three, if we care, you know, if we're going to work on ho ending homelessness, we have to try to protect low-income renters and keep them housed because otherwise we're, we're just undermining our own ability to make any progress and it's also the right thing to do, the equitable thing to do. And four, uh, we spent six months working with Race Forward, carefully evaluating uh, all the policy issues here. We, I'm not saying we got it perfectly right, but we really tried hard to make sure that racial equity is front and center in every one of the policies that we uh, talk about and support here today, and call us on it if you don't think we're doing that right. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, quantifying the state investing in homelessness and affordable housing at the same level it does education. About $18 billion a year is what the state, at least when we did this calculation, the spending supporting public education. What would it look like if the state spent a similar amount of money on homelessness and affordable housing as essential infrastructure, just the way education is? That's what it will take. And we understand that you have to pay for things in Sacramento. We have a balanced budget, unlike the federal government. So we worked really hard to come up with $23 billion of possible ways of raising revenues that have a nexus with the proposals that we uh, put together. Next slide, please. The payoff to the state, if the state can get to this level of $18 billion a year, the same as education, is huge. Not only do we get to house uh, our low-income populations and help them build equity in home ownership, but we're also going to be able to substantially uh, increase state and local economies and jobs um, in ways that basically mean this, pro this look at that $14 billion in state and local taxes. So we're asking the state to put in $18 billion a year, but look what's coming out annually, $14 billion. And you can add up these other numbers and give them whatever weight you want. This we think is a balanced equation, but the state has to think at a different scale if it's gonna to get to this kind of an equation, which pays for itself. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna turn this over, Cynthia. Yeah, 
Um, so just taking a look back at 2021, I know the past couple years, every year feels like a million years, but just recently, um, the, the legislature really made a historic investment in housing and homelessness that we haven't seen ever before. And so they really kind of um, increased the, the, the funding in a way that was uh, incredible for advocates, but also, you know, not everything that we need. So we saw 12 billion in funding to address the crisis. Um, broken down beneath, you'll see some of the, the highlights here. But for Western Center on Law and Poverty, what we were really sort of struck by is that the governor, you know, even in, in his, his address, even before COVID happened, he said, I'm going to prioritize housing and homelessness, something that I think many of us advocates here in the room have been, you know, screaming for for years and years and years because it's been sort of decades of inaction. And I love that this panel is called Advancing Bold Solutions at Scale because it seems like something that should have happened a long time ago. And so we're sort of picking up the pieces and, and starting there. And last year was sort of the, the legislature in California's first step into saying, okay, let's put money uh, and dedication to, to this crisis. Um, so that's sort of the large package that we're seeing here. And back to me, just to talk about the first two items. I want to make sure we give this administration, as Cynthia just said, credit. They did come forward with really bold, important ideas and a large amount of money. Those first two bullets, Project Home Key, uh, Project Room Key, which isn't even on this mm -hmm. list because it's not about permanent housing, is, was a huge uh, deal. No, one, no other state, when we would get on the National Income Housing Coalition state partners calls and compare notes with other states, nobody else had a Project Room Key or a Project Home Key. They were looking to us, and no, it didn't take care of all the urgent needs mm -hmm. of the pandemic. But I do believe they did everything they could uh, with, with, with innovation and a deep investment. The second bullet talks about the crisis we had with tens of thousands of affordable rental homes waiting for state tax exempt bonds and tax credits. And some of you in this room might know, know this firsthand because your projects have been lingering. These are homes that should be available but for this problem of uh, inadequate federal resources. And the state stepped forward in a very innovative way and basically said, we're not going to wait for those federal resources. We are going to advance all the money that the feds would have provided for at least a generation of projects to make this pipeline move. That was bold. That was big. I, w I ha couldn't imagine any other administration doing this. So big credit to this administration for doing both those things. And then I'll mention uh, another, you know, significant thing that happened last year. I think everyone knows about some of the homelessness programs we've seen in recent years um, that kind of started under the, the Brown administration with the HEAT program and then followed by uh, the, what's called the HAP program. I always like to joke we're going to next call something HOP and then just go from there and keep using these H&Ps. But um, the, this last year, all of these, these years, there was one-year allocations. We'd always talk about, you know, this is a one-year allocation. you got to come back next year, and it's just mm -hmm. this perpetual uh, state of having to figure out uh, things year over year. And this last year was the first time um, we actually saw a multi-year investment in a program around homelessness. And so mm -hmm. it was both a multi-year investment, but it was also a program that's meant to th kind of lay the foundation moving forward because local jurisdictions are now going to have to start putting together action plans, coming up with measurable goals and achieving those measurable goals and so it's a really significant change in the, the way that we've addressed homelessness. And that kind of, you know, was, was a sea change from, from previous years. So we were really excited by that. And, and one other thing on, <clears throat> I want to mention, it's hard not to mention, it's been the fourth, this is the fourth year, I think, now. We've seen this governor prioritize the, the state low-income housing tax credit uh, investment of $500 million. He's done that every year in his January budget, and I think it's something we, our organizations, have all, uh, CHPC and, and Housing California, have consistently advocated for. So always happy to see that continue to move forward. Um, I'll, I'll also add some of the bills that we were excited about that passed last year. Um, I'll start with AB 1043, Brian. Um, so it actually created a new income category as it relates to land use planning, and so it created a, um, the acutely low income, ALI, um, to be 15% or lower uh, uh, of the area median in income. And I think 
One thing that I find really elegant about this is that it's such a simple bill, right? We're just starting and saying in statute that there's a new um, income category, but really that's the starting point so that we can start planning for housing, seeing if we're building enough housing for, for that, uh, that income level. And so it's just naming that, uh, you know, the AMI system that we have uh, currently just wasn't actually capturing how low income Californians were living. There's so many Californians that are in this income category and they just were completely not addressed uh, in land use planning. And so that is a step one that I think Western Center um, is really, really excited about. We, we supported the bill and we're excited that that passed last year. Um, and also shout out to Assemblymember Brian for stepping in in the middle of a, of a, uh, a year and, and, and Taken, taken the helm on that one. Um, the other one I'll, I'll highlight is AB 1304 Santiago. And so that actually added a little bit more teeth to the, uh, the duty to affirmatively further fair housing and AFFH. It's a, it's a mouthful. Um, I started at Western Center last year and I'm, you guys will be proud of me. I actually got that through without uh, messing it up. So I, I'm, I'm proud of myself today. But essentially what AFFH means is that jurisdictions must look at their policies and undo the, the, the racist um, harm that occurred essentially uh, decades ago. And so I think everyone's aware um, that essentially in land use planning, um, there are certain people that have been blocked out of certain opportunities and that's, that's people of color. Um, black people, Latinos, those with disabilities have been unable and to have the, the same opportunities as their white counterparts. And that was by design. And so what AB 686, which was passed by California, um, I think uh, in 2018 did was say, now jurisdictions must look at their land use planning, look at where they're designating housing and saying, is this furthering segregation? Are we undoing past harm? And so 1304, what, that, what they did is, or what we did, we sponsored that bill, is to um, add more teeth to that, to that duty. And essentially what we were finding was that there was jurisdiction saying, you know, we are not segregated. We just have a mostly you know, white population. We're like, well, look next door, right? What's their population? It's a mostly Latino population. You are segregated. Um, so what, and I'm, I'm not joking, guys. That's literally what, what jurisdictions were doing. So essentially, 1304 says, you must look at a regional area and say, look, are you undoing the past harms um, of segregation and, and undo do that harm? And so for us, it's huge. Um, it doesn't make a splashy news, um, but I think it's, it's really telling for housers that in 2022, we are still fighting tooth and nail <laughs> to uh, ensure that all individuals, regardless of their race or background, have the same opportunity in housing. So um, I think that was huge, and I wanted to highlight those two. And quickly before we jump to the, to the next part, I'll mention the other two bills real fast. Um, AB 816 is building off of, um, or built off of a program <clears throat> that we helped create in my first year at Housing California, uh, which was AB 74, is the Housing for Healthy California program, which was meant to look at Medi-Cal beneficiaries and, that are uh, unhoused and, and providing them supportive housing. Um, and that was using an existing uh, federal program called the, the National Housing Trust Fund and using, utilizing those resources for that purpose. Um, and so AB 816, and that expired. That uh, was a three-year allocation, so that expired. And so we started, as the National Housing Trust Fund started to get larger and larger each year, um, which comes from the feds, that um, we started to think about could we provide, building off of Housing for Healthy California, provide some type of prioritization so that since this program is so large, um, taking it to scale and also keeping kind of the, the goal of Housing for Healthy California, AB 816 kind of continued that, but what it does now is provide a little bit more flexibility where we're still going to be prioritizing people that are unhoused, but making sure that we can keep that flexibility for that, that program now that it's much larger. I think it's the largest it's ever been. So, um, And then the next one, I'll, the other one I'll mention is AB 1220. This is, uh, re it, it did a few things. It renamed what was previously called the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council. Um, it's a, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and, uh, and that was created a few years ago to kind of coordinate our state's response with so many different agencies and departments touching on homelessness that the goal of the, the HCFC was to, to coordinate those resources and kind of think through how we work across departments and agencies. Um, and then under 1220, what that did was start to uh, think more intentionally about the leadership structure uh, of the, the council. It now has co-chairs 
from uh, the BCSH agency, Lourdes Cash Ramirez, and, um, uh, and also now uh, Dr. Galley, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. They are co-chairing that um, and made a little bit of a structural change, created a new lived uh, experience advisory council and made some changes there to kind of think about our structure moving forward. So I'll mention that. Should we go to the next slide? You bet. So, okay, I think it's on. Um, as you all can see, this year, past year, hit some high wa water marks. Um, but like Cynthia said, it's obviously not all we need. We're far from that. And we wanted to provide those accomplishments and put them in context. And so this is sort of an assessment, um, and my colleagues will sort of break these down for you. But as you can see, we're not giving ourselves, we're not giving our legislature, f you know, four, uh, or, or what's the max here? Five little houses? Uh, we're not, um, for all of these areas. And these are the areas, if folks have not seen the roadmap home, that we divided up the, you know, the various buckets of the various policies we need. The idea behind the roadmap home is that there's a consensus. Folks need to know that there, there is a consensus amongst what we need as, as the policies. Now we just need to and, you know, make sure there's a consensus in the political will. And that's also you know, what, why you all are here and why we're hoping you all can carry this message. Is it Cynthia, you or Cynthia gonna? Yeah, I can, I can start that. with the, um, just the drilling down a little bit on investing in our values. So that list we just looked at of the $12 billion, that was huge, right? But let's break that down on an annual basis. And because we know that that $12 billion does not solve the problem, we know we need $18 billion a year. We, we talked about that. So I don't know if any of you saw, we just published a report at the partnership uh, last month about basically another version of a state report card. And one thing we looked at is we calculated how much the state spent supporting mostly wealthy, mostly white, homeowners, mm -hmm. not, and then it's not, we should change that, but that's how it is today. We spent almost six uh, billion dollars uh, supporting that population with mortgage interest deductions, real property tax deductions, uh, some other specialized programs, and 99% of that six billion dollars is permanently baked into the state budget every year, year after year, it's not debated, it's not discretionary, it just happens. Let's flip that over to the budget, the amount the state spent last year on supporting renters, mostly low income, mostly people of color. Mm -hmm. The amount actually went up substantially, the highest it's ever been since we tracked this. It was a little under $5 billion. That's sounding like we're getting to some kind of parity, right? Well, we drilled down one other level. We looked at, of the $5 billion, how much of that is permanent or even long term? And how much of that goes away with each budget year? And the answer is only 10% of the, of the little less than $5 billion in the budget that's benefiting renters, mostly low income, mostly people of color, is permanent. That other 90%, it's totally discretionary. Each year, the governor and legislative leaders work out how much more they feel like giving from whatever surplus we have. That's why we're only giving the three houses rating here. Even though this was a historic year, as Cynthia began by noting, it's because there's no long-term plan here yet. It's just short-term, and that's why we can't rest. That's why we have to keep working hard. Who wants to talk about the next one? Cynthia, do you want to do growth? Yeah, I kind of want to highlight um, reimagining growth. And I, I love... Um, you know, I personally, when I was in school, I didn't like a, a report card, but I think legislators, <laughs> legislators, it's nice to give them a report card and see how they're doing. Um, the reason why we've endorsed the Roadmap Home is that because it, it encapsulates several pieces of what we like to describe the housing crisis, but when we're really talking about it, it's more than just the housing crisis, right? We have a homelessness crisis. We have affordable housing crisis. It's multiple issues that we're trying to sort of tackle with one cohesive vision. And so when we look at reimagining growth, there was a, a lot of splashy bills last year related to um, building or, or, or producing 
um, but, uh, housing. I think many of, of us can think of SB9. You've probably heard about that, SB10. Um, but now when we're looking at how much housing has being built or if it's being utilized, it, the, the numbers are pretty low. For us at Western Center, when we're thinking about those with the highest need, we need more affordable housing for those who, the low income Californians. Like, say it louder for the people in the back. We need people, we need housing for low income Californians. Last year, those bills were not targeted to creating housing for low income Californians. Yes, there will, there will be some, some um, positive benefit there because I think the crisis is large and we need moderate income housing, we need all kinds of housing. But for the need, we were woefully, um, underperforming in that regard. And so when I had, you know, chatting with folks about um, these bills, I think I think that's great, but I think we need more solutions. Um, and we would like to see when we're, we're talking about production that um, there's a there's a understanding that the, the highest need is for low, com, low income Californians. Everyone's feeling squeezed. I live in Sacramento. I, even moderate above mod income individuals are having a hard time uh, locating a, an apartment complex. Uh, I hope folks caught um, Katie Valenzuela, Council Member Valenzuela's comments yesterday about the affordability of, of a, an apartment here in, in Sacramento. There are one bedroom selling for 3,000. It's, it's unbelievable. And so even just looking at that, we can tell um, that those with the highest needs are, are so struggling. And so that's why um, I think we could do a lot better in that regard. I think I'm gonna be talking just a little bit about the protecting people um, category, this is the bucket of policies that we are hoping um, keeps renters housed, keeps folks in their homes. Um, obviously with COVID, um, there was a lot of work that was done this past year to make sure folks who are facing rental debt because being impacted by, by COVID, um, that they stay, stay housed. So, you know, um, props to the legislature for you know, um, moving forward. But at the same time, I will say, they were mostly di di dispersing funds that came from the federal government, right? Like there wasn't any state money. Had there not been fed those federal funds, I, I wonder where we would have been with, you know, $5.2 billion of rental debt in California, right? How many more homelessness would we see? Um, but just in general here, I, I think many of our organizations that focus on tenant advocacy or keeping folks housed, um, you know, didn't see a lot of, focused on the COVID uh, last year. One opp missed opportunity, we felt we've been trying to move forward a, um, a sort of a paradigm shift in regards to eviction prevention work to be able to reach tenants who, who might be facing an eviction, might be having issues with that before an eviction gets filed. And as part of that, we're hoping to be able to bring more partnerships between legal aid organizations and community, community and local governments that do tenant education and outreach. And so last year we had a bill, AB 1487. It did pass both houses, but there wasn't an allocation, again, to um, Matt's point. There wasn't an allocation for it, and so the governor vetoed it. We're bringing it back this year and hoping to be able to you know, get over that um, institutional in inertia sometimes about the way we do things um, to be able to streamline that. Should we go on to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, so this slide represents uh, all the collective asks of the statewide affordable uh, housing organizations working together um, to produce and preserve housing to, to make sure we come to the governor's office with a collective ask. It is not as comprehensive as the roadmap. It, it can't be. It's a one-year budget ask, and, and that means it's flawed just from the beginning. But we're working within a system which looks at spending year by year, unfortunately. And I'm just going to mention the very first item is one we were hoping not to have to ask for. And this is to continue the California Housing Accelerator Program intervention uh, that is needed because Congress failed to pass Build Back Better. They failed to uh, provide us with effectively more tax and bonds and more access to uh, low-income housing tax credits. So we're now in the situation where if the state doesn't 
step up and refund and even expand this program for the next three years? Let's think about this realistically. The, the party that cares more about affordable housing is going to be out of power starting in this next election for at least two years, maybe three. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means we're not going to be able to count on the federal government to bail us out, to Francisco's point, mm -hmm. for these next few years. So the state has to think big as we spend this lot, what may be the last of uh, large surpluses for a while. And if the state doesn't put aside a lot of money in this accelerator program, what it means is tens of thousands of affordable homes that are in the pipelines of many of the people in this room are just going to sit there waiting. Some may eventually die because they can't just keep waiting. They've got to go forward or the financing falls apart. So that's a really important ask. I think the administration hears us. They haven't committed yet, but uh, that's why it's, it's at the top. Chris? Yeah, I'm going to mention two here. One is just we need to keep up the momentum around homelessness resources. We have to, of course, we need to build more housing, but we also need to provide resources to people who are unhoused today. We have people that are suffering on our streets today. And, um, and so we need to make sure that we provide those resources. It has to be a both and. We have to do both. We have to build more capital, more units, and we also have to provide resources like rental assistance, services, um, operating subsidies, things like that, to make sure that we can get people into units um, today and get them some safety, some health uh, resources, you know, whatever they need uh, through a Housing First model to make sure that they have um, some stability and um, can start to, to uh, their path uh, under stable housing. So we want to keep that up. We have an ask around that $5 billion to make sure that we can can move that, keep that momentum fo moving forward. It's a five-year request and want to keep that that multi-year aspect to, to our um, our investments in homelessness. And maybe one day we'll get to an ongoing source, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, maybe a little too visionary. But um, And then the other one is uh, I wanted to highlight on the, uh, the last one at the bottom there. This is something I've worked on actually at Housing California every year I've been here. Um, and it's uh, an area in which I feel like our state continues to fail people, which is our, our reentry population, people that are leaving state prison. Um, you know, we, uh, we often give people, you know, when, when people are, are leaving prison, they're given a $200 visa gift card and good luck. And, uh, and you know, when people are reentering, they really struggle to find housing. It's one of the populations that people, you know, when you are, are discriminated against continuously, and so we need, as a state, to start thinking about how we can address that. So, um, and you know, two statistics I look at. One is uh, people that are formerly incarcerated are seven times more likely to experience homelessness. Mm. And then about 50% of our unhoused population report a history of incarceration. So this, this cycle of incarceration and homelessness just perpetuates itself. So what this bill does, <clears throat> this is a bill and a budget request, um, something we love to do. Uh, and this is in, we'll talk about the bill a little bit later. But this, uh, this budget ask is $200 million to start a reentry housing and workforce development program. So get people into housing, get them the services they need, get them some workforce development services, mm -hmm. and start to get them on that path to uh, reentering. Uh, I'll just uh, hop on to that one as well. Western Center is proud to uh, co-sponsor both of those efforts. And from our perspective, um, ensuring that these individuals have housing first, it, it aligns with the state's goal of a housing first model. And what that means is that when you have housing, when you have stability, then you are able to essentially um, deal with all the other aspects of your life. You need that home, right? You need that center first before you can start dealing with everything else. And so what we love about that proposal is that it's really focused on housing those individuals and giving them the services while they're there. So um, absolutely want to want to uplift that one. And one other one on this slide I wanted to uplift is the 500 million to preserve at risk and naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, this would fund the acquisition of a currently unsubsidized housing and ensure that you know organizations, whether they're mission-driven or individuals, can purchase these buildings and preserve them as affordable. Um, I think it's really key when we're talking about this crisis that we have housing, right, that, that, that is affordable. How do we preserve it? And, and I think uh, preservation is something that um, sometimes you know we, we start to forget to think about but we really need to preserve what we have and so that one is super super key and called the cap program um, and we're really excited about uh, that one as uh, an effort for Western Center as well I just want to add on to your comment Cynthia about that the um, this was the first year of the partnership we, we annually publish 
how much existing rent restricted housing we have in the state of California, roughly 500,000 homes, and how many we've lost and how many we're losing. And this year for the first time we looked at what um, some, we sometimes call naturally occurring affordable housing. I think the um, conversation here yesterday in this, this room was good. The enterprise folks said we call this unsubsidized affordable housing because there's nothing natural about our markets and the way they work. Uh, so we can, we can hold both those thoughts. But uh, we counted uh, about 1.1 million uh, unsubsidized, currently affordable homes throughout the state of California. We don't yet have good data on this, but what uh, was presented in yesterday's panel was that the Bay Area alone is losing 32,000 of those unsubsidized affordable homes annually, or did over a period of time. We can extrapolate a little bit what that looks like as a state. The point being, there's private equity, there's Wall Street firms out there. Some of you know this because you bid against them and lost because they, they, they take such a short-term time horizon for their investments and they have such deep pockets, it's almost impossible to compete against them. So this budget ask would try to start leveling the playing field so that nonprofit and community-based organizations have the resources to do better in this, co this competition, which is very unnatural. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be about commodified homes. These are people's homes, but this is the way the market treats this. And there's another bill we'll talk about later that adds to this. Should we go on to the next slide? Yeah. Oh, yeah, here we are. Do you want to start with CA too? Sure. Uh, constitutional amendments. Um, so there's a couple that are, are really exciting here, but I will focus on SCA2, which has been a long time effort to repeal Article 34 of the Constitution. And so um, Article 34 essentially requires that uh, a, a jurisdiction cannot acquire or create a low income housing project without the authorization of the majority of the voters in that jurisdiction. And what that does, it presents a s significant constraint to the development and preservation of affordable housing. And um, you know, let's be honest, it's, it was racist, right? When this was implemented, it was a racist response to a public housing in that jurisdiction. And so what we have here is a vestige of the past that's still in the Constitution. And all it's done, essentially, is um, made California sort of fall behind in terms of the public housing that we have across the state. Um, when you compare the numbers of public housing uh, units in California to other large states such as New York, Illinois, we fall behind. We are far, far behind. And this became an issue recently, and just, just to kind of um, contextualize this, you know, when we were having discussions about the Build Back Better package, um, there was uh, assistance uh, to, you know, update and support public housing, but the lion's share of those, that funding would have gone to other states. It wouldn't have gone to California. And so that was the first time where, where Newsom and folks here were saying, shoot, um, how can we affect the Build Back Better plan so we can get more funding for our housing crisis? And so that is just one aspect where you can see years later where we're still seeing the impact of, of, S, of Article 34. Um, the most recent time that uh, we tried passing this was in the 90s. And a lot has changed since then, right? Um, but I'll just highlight um, this here, which is, At the time, in the 90s, people voted, this got onto the Constitution, this got on the ballot, and it, it, it failed considerably. And that was because individuals didn't want to lose, uh, at least jurisdictions, the idea that they would lose their voting power, right? But we know that that's deeply rooted in uh, nimbyism, right? We just don't, we, we wanna say in our neighborhoods. And so I think a lot has changed since then. I think a lot of folks are realizing that we've stopped the production of, of affordable housing. And this housing is, um, you know, let's, let's face it, it's, it's mostly for low income people of color. And so we have to surpass that, those views of nimbyism. And what SCA2 would do, and the, if the legislature is to pass it, would put um, Article 34 on the ballot so Californians can vote to remove it from the Constitution. Um, I'll note that with all constitutional amendments, if it were to make it on the ballot, it takes a lot of money to, <laughs> to fund this, right? It takes an education campaign to let Californians know how, um, 
you know, damaging uh, Article 34 has been. Um, and, and, you know, telling them that, look, you're not losing out on anything. If anything, your, your communities will grow and be more vibrant and be better overall. Um, and so that is SCA2. Like I said, there is a, some pushback in terms of whether we'll have the money to fund this to get it on the ballot. But we know as advocates that there are other ways that we can um, tackle this issue. I know that uh, Council Member Fife yesterday um, said in Oakland that they're, they're really, really hyper-focused on, on uh, you know, removing Article 34 and getting rid of it once and for all. And so I think it's something that everyone in the room should be excited about or thinking about. Um, and that is um, ongoing. So Western Center is a sponsor of that, along with a lot of other organizations. And um, you know, uh, Cal Yimby, uh, the, the California Realtors, Housing California. Um, it's a, wad, uh, a wide swath of organizations that are finally ready to remove this from the Constitution. So wanted to highlight that one. Can can I just ask how many people had heard about Article 34 in your hands? Okay, how, can you keep it up if you think your families have heard about Article 34? Okay, um, that's the challenge, right, that Cynthia is talking about when it comes to something that's on the ballot box. It's not just the folks in this room, which everybody should have raised their hand. I, I didn't know about this until I started working in this issue. But then how do we get our families and friends to also know about it? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I'm going to start us on this next one. I think all four of us <laughs> want to talk about this next one, which is pretty incredible, which is ACA 14. Um, and uh, what's up? Oh, I saw a hand up. I think we're taking questions afterwards. Um, so on ACA 14, this came from uh, Assemblywoman uh, Buffy Wicks. She's the chair of our housing committee. Um, and she brought this forward, which uh, Matt talked earlier about, you know, we have a requirement in our state budget to invest a certain amount of resources every year for public education. Um, and we should have the same requirement for housing, right? We need to make sure that every year we're investing in this resource that is just a basic need. It's a deter social determinant of health. We need to make sure that we are starting to think about housing as, um, as something that is invested in and guaranteed to be invested in in the budget every year. So what ACA 14 does is it puts 5% uh, of the general fund every single year into housing development, homelessness resources, and home ownership resources. And, um, and it also talks, similar to the roadmap, it talks about a 10-year investment plan. So actually starting to think in long-term uh, you know, planning in 10 years to think about how can we use these resources that we would have, I think, based on my, it's 10 billion, I think, 5% of 200, it's about 10 billion mm -hmm. uh, annually, um, which is still not quite 17 uh, billion, but it is a significant change. Uh, and so this would be starting to think through a 10 year investment plan and how we're gonna utilize these resources annually um, every year. And so it's a significant change in the way that we address uh, housing and homelessness. And I think all of us were like thrilled when the Assemblywoman brought this forward and hopefully we can all rally behind it. Anything and else? it's long term, right? This addresses the fundamental disparity yeah. in how the state's been allocating resources between homeowners and renters. This would actually put something on the table, not for one budget year out of one surplus, mm -hmm. but potentially long term, forever. So it would be huge. Who's talking about the next one? Do you want to take it? Francisco, do you want to talk about your ACA one? Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, go for it. Okay. All right, so school bonds get passed based on a 55% vote. Anybody want to guess on average? It's not easy to pass a school bond. They're really important for facilities. Anyone want to guess what percentage of time do school bonds pass on average over the last 10 years? 80, 85% of the time they pass. That's actually really good. It shows communities care and they overcome their concerns about taxes and, um, and their own pocketbooks to invest in their communities. Housing bonds are treated differently. Mm -hmm. They require a two-thirds majority in most cases mm -hmm. to be passed. Anyone want to guess what percentage of the time housing bonds are passed by local communities? 25% mm. is a good guess. It's, it is closer to 50% of the time, but that's only because so many people never even try to go to the ballot. 
I see Evie Stivers from San Mateo County nodding. I know others of you in this room have thought or worked on housing bonds locally. Imagine if housing bonds had the same 55% threshold mm -hmm. or even lower as being proposed in a new ballot initiative that's exciting down to simple majority. That would enable local governments to and local populations to agree to tax themselves to deal with their number one priority, homelessness and the lack of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Today, that doesn't happen. Anyone here from San Diego? Well, San Diego fought a valiant uh, bond measure. They got 57% of the vote in the last election cycle. And you know what? That wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So $1 billion that they had worked on for housing and homelessness was not realized. That happens across the state. So this measure would bring tens of thousands of new affordable homes a year to the state and basically unleash ourselves, our citizens, mm -hmm. to, to do what we know is needed even if the state isn't ready to completely step up. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think we're passionate about this measure. Right. I think one thing I'll note about all these three pieces here is that we're trying to remove barriers. There are so many barriers to creating the housing at the scale that we need and preserving the housing. And so we, we would like to send these to the voters and say, let's, let's remove all these barriers. The crisis is too large to have these in our way, so. Which in terms of process, we, we should have mentioned to that point, <laughs> all constitutional amendments pa that pass through the legislature, it's not just over there, then it has to then go to the ballot. Uh, it's a, a way for the legislator, legislature to place things on the ballot and then they go for a vote uh, among voters in the election. And I believe all of these are targeting um, uh, the next election, which mm -hmm. is November, so. Perfect. All right. Who wants to start us on this <laughs> very short list of bills we have here? Um, Francisco, did you have one? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just talk. There, there are a couple of opportunities to, con you know, uh, move us forward further and create a, a more robust infrastructure for protecting people, renters, keep them in their homes. Um, one of the you know, dynamics that Matt talked about with um, corporate real estate and re real estate investors in general for the for-profit market out there is that many times that profit motive um, really uh, comes in conflict with people's ability to be stably housed. Um, so one example of that is the Ellis Act. This is a law that we have on our books since the mid-90s that allows landlords to be able to leave the rental market. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, you know, we have no designation about what leaving the rental market is, right? So you do have rent some um, investors sort of buy new properties or buy properties that not new, but new to them, uh, buy properties, say they are going off the rental market in order to evict their current tenants who are paying less, their unsubsidized natural, you know, unsubsidized affordable housing um, in order to bring in new tenants. And so AB 2050 for this year is one opportunity to be able to disincentivize that profit motive that is un, you know, unsettling uh, folks' communities. Um, there are ad some additional um, bills out there that also move that forward, but just wanting to put that issue, sort of that context. Um, it's not just, you know, we do have this uh, corporate landlords making it harder to also buy first-time homes as well. As I'm sure folks have heard, um, that competition. Um, and. In, in general, I think we're trying to figure out, you know, create, an, as I said, an infrastructure for disincentivizing that profit motive that keeps, unhouses people. Do you want me to go to the top or you want to go? Uh, go, go ahead. Yes. Okay. So, well, item at the top, Assembly Bill 989 is one we've been working on. This is the second year. And this gets to the uh, point about we can make all the plans we want under the regional housing needs assessment for what should be built in each community. But when the nonprofit housing 
providers in this room and in this community go to actually build those developments, what happens? They're subjected typically to um, a long series, years of uh, battles over entitlements, requiring conditional use permits, uh, California Environmental Quality Act reviews, which should have been done at the plan level, but because they weren't are now being reapplied and slowing down and sometimes even stopping altogether developments. And often they're not in my backyard groups that use these laws because they know they can stop or at least dramatically slow down the process. So, and there are affordable housing providers in this room that are faced with this choice. They could go to court to enforce the laws that have been passed to, to help them, but going to court is a very time consuming process in most cases. It can take years mm -hmm. and it's very expensive, mm -hmm. exactly. So what if instead there were a way that an affordable housing provider who's following the law, following the community plan, but being opposed by the local process could instead appeal directly to the state to intervene and not have to go to court and have their case decided in 60 to 90 days. We think that would have a dramatic impact in allowing affordable housing to move ahead on a more predictable schedule with lower costs and uh, make a huge difference. So that's what this bill by Assemblymember Gabriel would do. Um, and I hope that you, you agree it's worth supporting. Yeah. Working down the list, um, AB 1816 is the, as I mentioned, the bill for the budget request we talked about earlier. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the assembly member Isaac Bryan will actually be here later today in person uh, at the Hot Topics panel, so I got to advertise my other panel uh, later today. So you'll be able to hear him uh, in person speak about this bill. Um, so AB 1816 is the reintroduction. Uh, Matt talked about how this is the second year of a cycle. There was a bill last year, AB 328, from uh, former assemblyman David Chu. And, um, and then Isaac Bryan took that one over uh, and it, this year, and it unfortunately was held in Appropriations Committee. But that was mainly because they wanted to allow, it would have had to, there were some timeline issues with that. So they essentially just restarted the process um, with this bill. Uh, it is exactly the same as AB 328. And just to add a couple things, I talked about the budget request earlier um, about what the bill does. It really starts to think through in the structure around uh, in reach services, so also going into state prison and talking to people and doing some planning for when they're exiting um, and doing some of that, um, that planning around their housing exit and the services they may need uh, when they exit uh, state prison. And, uh, and as I mentioned, it has workforce development services, uh, really robust uh, services, and it really focuses on racial equity within this program, uh, particularly as we talk about the providers. It talks about having um, people with lived experience on, uh, in, included in organizations who are implementing this program and uh, having a racial equity focus within those organizations specifically, um, not just the population served, but the people serving them. So it's a really uh, a step forward in that, uh, that sense too, thinking through how we use racial equity and how we uh, address this, uh, this issue. Um, and that bill is out of housing and it is now uh, going to Appropriations Committee, uh, and we're hopeful it'll move forward, but you'll hopefully be able to hear uh, the Assembly member talk about it later today. Perfect. Do you want to talk about 1911? Sure, I'll talk about Assembly Bill 1911 just briefly. We talked earlier about the 500 million to help uh, nonprofit housing providers compete with the uh, private equity market to buy up the unsubsidized affordable buildings. And this is another tool, it's a very wonky tool that we came up with that would basically provide a tax benefit that nonprofit housing providers could come get at the state and then take it and it would be a huge negotiating advantage to show up to an owner of a 100 unit apartment building who's got the private equity folks saying, we'll give you cash right now, $10 million for your property. Here's, take the deal, actually, that math is not quite right, but um, we'll give you cash in the barrel, we'll close within 30 days. It's pretty hard for people to compete in that situation, except if you can also bring a tax credit that would lower that owner's capital gains taxes if they sold to you for the purpose of preserving the affordability of that property. 
So again, this is part of that package that we're hoping the mm -hmm. legislature will send to the governor. Perfect. And shout out to, uh, to folks leading on that. Western Center is also a sponsor of that bill and really excited about it. And just a little bit of level setting. Right now it's April. All of these bills have been introduced this year. They're going through the process of going through the first house, whether it's in the assembly. A, B means assembly bill. S, B means Senate bill. Um, so to going through that process, going through policy committees. So they're still definitely in play. Um, and then we'll switch over likely around May to the other house and then hopefully to be signed around uh, September. So just a little bit of level setting there. Uh, Western Center wants to highlight uh, two more of these bills. Um, I'll start with 2713 Wix. It's the second to the bottom there, just cause eviction modifications. Um, a couple years ago, at Western Center and other fantastic organizations, tenant uh, rights organizations, Housing Now and, and, and our partners there, uh, passed a bill called AB 1482, which prohibited rent gouging and established just cause ev eviction protections in California. It was a landmark bill. Uh, and it was the first state that were to do so. And so, um, you know, with the excitement of that bill, and we've heard across the state from our partners that there were a couple of loopholes, or at least some, some opportunities where landlords were still able to evict tenants with no cause in certain circumstances, and I'll go over the three. So if, if an owner or a close family member would be moving into the unit as their primary residence, so you could kick out your, your tenant and say, well, I'm moving in, sister's moving in, you, you have to leave the unit. Second, the owner will be doing substantial renovations to the unit um, that would require permits, and so it can't be done with the tenant in place, and so therefore the tenant would be displaced so that they could do the renovations. And third is that the owner is exiting the rental market, which is an aspect that Francisco had mentioned earlier. So those were three pieces and components where tenant or landlords were still able to ev essentially evict their tenants. Um, but what we have found is that this was sort of a pretext to uh, evicting tenants so that they would go back, add the unit to the rental market, and then sell it at a higher, at, and rent it at a higher, higher price, right? So that is essentially gaming 1482 and the protections that we worked really, really hard to fight for. And so, um, you know, 1482 uh, was amazing, fantastic. We've got some loopholes. And so, you know, wh while tenants are being forced out of their homes, um, you know, we would just like to add some teeth in there and say, let's tighten the language around, uh, around no-fault evictions, and ensure that these provisions are, are used only in legitimate circumstances. Just prove that you actually are moving into the unit, right? And that would be easily proven if you just checked it and said, look, six months later, the, the, the landlord is still living in the unit. There aren't such protections in there right now, and so currently we're seeing um, tenants, particularly in the context we are now, which is we are still very much in COVID. We're, I see we're, we're wearing masks still. There are folks that still haven't been able to pay for some of the rent that they missed during the, the, the pandemic. Um, and one thing I, I really wanna highlight here is that um, for low-income Californians, we're still in crisis mode. There are folks that you know, they, they haven't realized that low-income people are still reeling from the pandemic. They haven't, they've lost wages. They took on debt using their credit cards to try to pay for their rent. And so there's all these circumstances where there's two worlds happening in California. Those are the ones that have done better, and in many cases done better. The, the budget is flush with cash. Um, people are back to work. And then there's the other reality, which is where low-income Californians are still fighting uh, to maintain their homes and they're losing protections as we speak. And so um, I think that's why it's incredibly important in the context that we are now to ensure that 1482 is, is implemented and, and utilized in the best way possible so that tenants aren't um, evicted and then become homeless. Uh, the, the other bill I'd like to mention is AB 2710, Above the Wicks Bill, Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, which we mentioned a little bit in the budget context. But essentially, this bill would give tenants and el eligible nonprofits or entities um, the first opportunity to purchase rental housing when the owner decides to sell the property. Um, that first chance, that first bite of the apple is huge. And so the number of homes on the private market 
that are accessible to low-income households currently is decreasing far faster than we can build affordable housing. So it's absolutely critical that the, do, that the housing that we do have, we preserve it. And so what this does is allow those tenants or, or, or nonprofits the right to match an offer made on properties by a third party. And so we're leveling the playing field once more and ensuring that housing purchased through this policy would be preserved as permanently affordable with protections and for existing um, and future tenants. This is really, I kind of want to contextualize this a bit, community land trusts, um, you know, maybe it's a, a nonprofit that would like to have the first bite of the apple to, to purchase the property and remove it from the speculative market. I think that's incredibly big. I've heard, I'm heartened to see some of the discussions yesterday um, uplift community land trusts. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you heard Council Member Fife and Council Member Valenzuela yesterday um, during plenary uplift this as well. Um, there are local jurisdictions already have local ordinances that do a COPA or TOPA um, campaign. And this is just actually a statewide um, uh, version of those ordinances. And it's um, going to be a really hard fight. So absolutely would would love your support on any of these bills. And one way to do that is to call into committee, um, connect with Francisco and I, uh, Housing Now in particular, about how you can um, assist us in the, in, the, in the effort to get these bills passed through so that we can sign them into law at the end of this year. So those are the ones that I'll be covering. And I just want to add to that, that's, a, that's also a huge priority of Housing California. Uh, Jack and our team has been leading the, the Stable Homes Coalition uh, that's been uh, pushing for that. And I love the acronym TOPA COPA. It's just something I just love to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's something we're really excited about and really excited to see uh, Assemblymember Calra lead that effort and, and hopefully secure that this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through our, uh, the, ones, the remaining Housing California ones that I want to hit on uh, so that we have time for questions. Um, first is AB 1961. This is actually, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, many of you know the Residents United Network at Housing California, um, and this bill came from the Residents United Network, All which right. thought yeah, of yeah. this bill. Um, yeah, and so it's really exciting to see that, that kind of authenticity with this bill. Um, it creates a, a statewide affordable housing database, which is really meant to be a place where People that are looking for affordable housing can come to 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 find affordable housing and uh, be able to hopefully be able to apply for affordable housing and try and streamline that side of things and create a, a way in which it's less uh, cumbersome for for residents uh, and and people searching for affordable housing. That's from Assemblymember Gabriel, and uh, will probably be heard in a housing committee later this month. There's two hearings left on the 20th and 27th. Um, the other two I'll quickly mention is um, or only one. Uh, is 2325. Uh, uh, this is a bill, as I mentioned before, there was AB 1220 um, from Assemblywoman Luz Rivas, which made changes to the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council. Um, but this has been an effort of hers since she took office to really think about what we need to do to truly uh, streamline our efforts around uh, uh, homelessness services. And so what this bill does is it uh, takes 1220, the, the previous bill, and goes a step further. It takes the uh, Cal ICH now, instead of, they're now called that, instead of the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council, it takes them out of where they currently sit. In the governmental structure, they're kind of buried under the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. This would take that council out of that agency and let it be its own standalone office to um, really have its own authority and be able to uh, coordinate services among the many agencies uh, the, and departments that work around homelessness. Um, and it also creates a funder's work group. There's so many different departments and agencies that touch homelessness, from our health department um, to our housing department, our Office of Emergency Services. Um, and, uh, and so there's so many different places in which there's homeless services and resources. And what it does is create a funder's work group. Keep, keeps all those people at one table to talk about standardizing services. So what uh, the term housing should be pretty straightforward. It isn't necessarily mm -hmm. for some folks. Um, and so kind of really defining what that means, right? So that the, these other programs that are working on homelessness have the same definition of housing and are actually uh, providing that and creating these um, consistencies across state programs to efi create efficiency and, uh, and, and achieve results. That is um, a bill being heard uh, on the 20th in Housing Committee. Please call in, support that one. We need as much help uh, moving that one forward because it is just a complete change uh, and re, uh, readjustment of how we actually 
uh, you know, have the governance structure around homelessness and create those efficiencies, which is a huge, as many that work in government know, it's really hard to make those kind of changes, and, uh, and so we're hopeful that that one all will happen this year, and I know the, the author's really committed to it. Whew, that's a long list of bills, and that's not even all the ones that we don't like. <laughs> that's just the ones we do like. So we could use your help on those ones as well, too. We should go to questions. Yeah, let's do it. Um, where did my thing go? I'll wait on a call to action. But um, do folks have questions in the room about the roadmap, about bills? I see your hand there. Yep, go for it. in the 1990s? Yes, there was. Um, gosh, I, I don't have the list now, but I think one thing I'll, I'll mention, so the, the group that actually implemented or, or pushed Article 34 um, in the 50s was the, the, the California Realtors Association. Um, you'll see that they are now in support of the repeal. So you can see that there's been a, a quite a big change um, in terms of, of folks' outlooks on this, and, and the realtors have actually now flipped over and are actually listed sponsors along with Western Center and other organizations. My question is, so okay, is... Hello, Jutapur, we're in San Francisco. So my question is, how do we change the housing laws to where, um, instead of a BMI, where, um, where we can just have... Look, People of color having um, the same, you know, equality when they're doing the um, getting a house, because that's we don't have anything like that. I, I really would be interested in to having something like that just for homeowners for for people of color and low income, so that they could actually sustain it, starting it from a pilot perspective. One thing I could just mention is the federal government is actually stepping in the Biden administration and putting out new rules for appraisers because we have all been reading about the historic uh, discriminatory mm -hmm. practices that the appraisers do, which drive a lot of that uh, bad behavior and make mm -hmm. it so difficult. So that's one thing I can add. I don't know if anyone else. I, I appreciate the question because there's so many aspects that have created a, a, a landscape where it's more difficult for people of color to, to attain housing. And so interge intergenerational wealth, right? So. Um, uh, one option and one thing that I'll note is that community land trusts are, are preserving or, or buying housing off the market and then with the promise that that would be affordable in perpetuity for the next homeowner. And so there are, are new innovative ways um, to keep housing off the speculative market because I think we're all acutely aware that housing is a commodity for the few, right? There's been a certain group of, of people that have been able to attain that intergenerational wealth. Um, I, I've heard this really, really sort of, um, it really touched me where I, I was listening to someone speak about how their grandmother, this is a black woman, said their grandmother was able to, to buy a house and because her grandmother owned a house, her mother was, was able to go to college and because her mother was able to go to college, she was able to go to college. And you can see just within a short period of time, just, your, just three generations there, about what a difference that, that home ownership really, really made. But I think now we're, we're grappling with the idea that perhaps there are other opportunities for shared equity um, so that it's not just the few, you get to build all this equity on your own and then you don't share it with your community. And I think there's um, other options out there so that it's more of a community focus. There's that, I know, um, I think maybe others can speak to in, in the housing, specifically in the housing space. There are loans and for, for low-income individuals, but they're hard to attain, right? So I think right, there's a, right, or, or, the, or, the, or the credit issue, right? So I think, you know, there, some of the bills that weren't on there, there's also uh, bills and efforts to um, ensure that um, credit doesn't uh, harmfully impact individuals from attaining a home. So your question is so loaded, I feel like we could spend a whole day, but there's a lot of different aspects that we can improve. Um, another thing I'll, I'll just note, and then maybe you can pass it along if anyone else has comments, but Western Center has been really thought, thinking about land use policy, which is where we build housing, and, and how, uh, you know, where, where, where we build, and who, whom is it for, and, and how is it, uh, you know, so for example, coastal cities, um, they tend to be more expensive, and so what you see is a segregation, right? Um, the Bay Area, it's becoming so expensive that it's resegregating and at, a, at a high rate. Um, so I think there are ways that we can think, uh, think about how we zone, perhaps, 
uh, to ensure that low-income individuals have an opportunity to, to for home ownership. Um, yeah. What was that? Your name, Western oh, Western. Uh, Western Center on Law and Poverty. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sure. I wanted to get an update on workforce housing. I wanted to see uh, what's currently happening with it and how it interacts with credits and bonds, and what are, uh, if any, are new efforts to expand it. Workforce housing. Tough question. That one might come to me. I'm going to guess. <laughs> Okay, workforce housing, depends a little how we, we define it, but Kareem, I think you're talking about serving people around the median income, is that 80 to 120 percent? That's what we're talking about? 60 to 120. 60 to 120. Okay, well there are a couple of bills. Um, one would make it easier for uh, nonprofit housing providers who want to serve people at higher income levels. Right now, to use the state property tax exemption, you can only go up to people, serving people at 80% of median and qualify. There is a bill on the table, I'm forgetting the number, <laughs> that would allow going up to 100% of median. So that's one thing I think that all of us are looking at trying to support. Uh, there's also the use of joint powers agreements, which is a very popular tool right now that uh, some of us think is being misused in many cases because Basically, it's a device where private entities create these partnerships with local governments, and then they don't pay any uh, property taxes uh, for a period of years. Um, and in return, rents are supposed to be lower. But these are luxury buildings that were Class A buildings. So the rent reductions we're talking about don't always really make them affordable. But we think there's a way to put some guardrails on that to make sure that there is good public benefit and to make it so that nonprofit housing providers like your organization, Ebaldsi, and uh, others in this room could actually fairly compete in that space and produce valuable public benefits. So that bill is AB 1850. And again, it would try to make it so that your organizations could use this tool uh, and show that it can be done respectfully with real public benefits. And that's, that's all I have to offer you on that one. I saw Karen, you had your hand up. Um, Karen Flock, could you talk a little bit more about Article 34? Because what I've heard is that the polling doesn't look good. Is the legislature waiting to see if people are going to raise money to, for the campaign? Um, just talk a little bit more about that. That's exactly right. And then I'll have uh, uh, Chris, maybe if he has any thoughts on this, or Francisco as well. Um, it, the, the issue with Article 34, which is really interesting, which is SCA 2, is that we, we have the votes in the legislature to get it passed and put on the ballot. It's all but sure that we, we can get it passed. The, the real problem is the education campaign um, a, around the state, which would cost a lot of money. And so currently, uh, there's been some, um, you know, that'll obviously be up to uh, Senator Weiner and, and Assembly, uh, Senator Weiner and Senator Allen, who are the, are the leads on the bill, whether they want to withhold the bill this year or move it forward. But we also have a really crowded ballot, <laughs> uh, which is also something that politically we have to think about. Um, if there's too much on there crowded, um, you know, it sort of moves the, the uh, voters' attention. But I think that's, you actually really hit the nail on the head there. Um, we're waiting for funding to really ensure that we have the right, the right, um, education campaign to get it done uh, because we would hate to lose it one more time, right? So it's been, it's been you know, uh, I think past due for us to, to talk about the issue. Um, I'm heartened to see um, legislators and other folks take the mantle on this, but it's going to take a lot of money to do it. Unfortunately, with um, the, the amount of <laughs> organi organizing that you need to do to get it to, to get to the voters. Yep. So I'm uh, Jeff Morgan with First Community Housing. We're doing, uh, getting into the area of permanent supportive housing, and I figure if operating costs are at about $25,000 per person, including rent, and you add up the numbers for 150000 that's about $4 billion a year of, of services and supports to, to annually kind of care for. Let's assume we house everybody. Now, I'm seeing a lot of efforts towards trying to increase housing supply, and I think a lot of Local jurisdictions are trying to come up with temporary solutions, mm -hmm. as are the county. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a hidden fear over the ability to actually have enough for services to, mm -hmm. to support the population. I'm kind of wondering, is there any 
Is that acknowledged in some of the ways the state is approaching trying to end homelessness? Do they have some ongoing subsidies that would basically keep, you know, it's one thing to put a tough shed out under a highway overpass. It's another thing to create a safe environment. I can take this one. Um, so uh, first, yes, you're right. Uh, the operating need is just, it's so large and the service need is really, um, really important. And, um, and so I'd point to a couple things. Um, one is on the, on the services piece, uh, we just went through an effort the state did uh, for something called Cal AIM. It's our, we love our acronyms. Uh, it's uh, our, essentially our new way of addressing uh, Medi-Cal in, in California. And there's a piece of that, there's uh, I think, um, uh, Karim Buchanan spoke about it yesterday from Health and Human Services Agency about the, the in lieu of services and enhanced care management pieces of that, which really are starting to look at some of the things that surround housing, housing navigation and things like that, but uh, it can't fund operating uh, services. And so there is a real need on that front. I think um, all of our organizations are, are looking at it in ways to creatively uh, advocate for that. I know part of our um, discussion this year in the budget is around um, utilizing some resources for operations and services. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something we just continue to see um, around the state. And as we think about, you know, as you mentioned, as you think about affordable housing development, you have to think about those operations needs and the services to, to make sure that it's going to be sustainable in the long term and not just in the near term. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a priority we have and, and all of our organizations are looking at. One, one thing I'll add on to this as well is um, I think we need to change, uh, this is, you know, people have worked on campaigns, hearts and minds about working with the unhoused. Um, we have a, a real workforce shortage of individuals that are willing to work with this population. And that should be very scary and um, very angering to everyone in the room. We need to make sure that we are supporting individuals to go and support these folks with, with compassion. Um, and I think Western Center is really concerned that a lot of the times when we're having these discussions about housing or short-term housing, permanent affordable housing, or permanent supportive housing, is that um, it, the intention behind it is really from mayors or, uh, or from other people's perspective to just remove the problem and, and remove it from eyesight. Um, and I just think that if we can leave this room and think about how we can be all a bit more compassionate about the, our unhoused neighbors, I think that would go a long way. Um, and supporting individuals that would like to spend their, their work assisting these individuals, because we need the, the services, but we also need people to be able to provide those services. So um, I think just something that I want to mention there. That's probably a good place for us to wrap up since we're over time. Chris? One quick question over here. Okay. Uh, the finance, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the finance for uh, all the states being funded, but then you mentioned that California is not being funded. I think you mentioned like New York and those other states, but California wasn't being funded. I think it was for the, um, the 14th SCA. It's, it's about public, public housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the historic. Um, it wasn't that the federal government denied California the funding. It was, as Cynthia pointed out, the history of racist practice by our, our realtor system, our realty system, that prevented uh, public housing authorities from uh, having uh, expanding the way they did in other states. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of building public housing. Mm -hmm. So if you look across California, on the other hand, has welcomed vouchers. So we have a proportionate share of vouchers, maybe about 15% of the country's vouchers. But public housing, we only have about 5% of the nation's public housing, and it's because of this historic discriminatory practice. Great. Well, then I will wrap us up here. Um, as you can see on the screen, I wouldn't be a lobbyist if I didn't have a call to action for folks. <laughs> um, you can follow us. Uh, go to the Roadmap website. It's really nice and branded and pretty. Um, and they did a lot of great work on there. You can find uh, how to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, all the fun stuff. And, um, and I just want to mention it to sign up for our email list because the um, end of year report, which we talked about earlier, about looking back at last year, it's much more thorough than what we were able to cover today. Um, you can see even legislators we highlighted that worked um, in partnership with us. So that will be shared as well as um, a summary of the 2020 U 2022 package of budget and policy priorities. So 
you'll find that uh, if you sign up for our email. Um, and then if you don't like the roadmap, I think David Zisser's still here. You can address <laughs> all of those to David, uh, who is the grandfather uh, or godfather of this uh, initiative. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's Thank all you. I've got. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you.